Uh, I'm Michael Johnson. Uh, I was born and raised here in Alexandria, Virginia back in night, November the 13th, 1956, to be exact. Uh, I've also went to public school here. Uh, pretty much stayed here my whole life. You know, right now I work for the Department of Recreation as the Community Outreach uh, slash, excuse me, Safe Place Coordinator. I went to Charles Houston and sat here in elementary school. Uh, prior to my family moving up here, me and my brother, well, me and my, I was nine, my younger brother and sister was eight, you know, and old, I had a couple of older brothers. And uh, when we moved up here from Queen Street, I lived right across the street from, uh, it was on Queen and uh, West where Jefferson Houston sits now. It was a school called Jefferson High School, all white, set up on the hill. And we used to always look over there with just all white students. Well, this was where my father had grown up as a kid. So this was his uh, neighborhood too. You know, it was a little different back then. You know, it was different when I grew up. But yeah, this is the neighborhood he come out of also. So he just moved back into a familiar setting, you know. And uh, my father was a groundskeeper. And my mother was a cook at uh, the famous Dixie Pig restaurant. And she, she worked there for like about 40 years, I believe. But my mother was the only person I knew that could, well, the only one I know in my family, that could cook and bake and didn't need a recipe. Or you just tell her, you know, you tell her what you wanted and she could just get it done, you know? Uh, so then from there I went over to Parker Gray, which was located, uh, it was Parker Gray Middle School. And that was for seventh and eighth grade. And that was on Madison Street. And that was the first time I ever seen a white teacher, you know? And it wasn't one of them, it was about like six or seven. So we wasn't really used to white teachers, you know? Because when we left Charles Houston, I'll never forget, uh, the superintendent we used to have what they called Mayday. And it was right out here on this parking lot, but it was, you know, a big, bigger parking lot then with the schools in there. And we practiced for like a month to do these dances around the little, I call it a lollipop pole or whatever, and little skits. And the guy walked, came down the steps, because he used to be a back step to Charles Houston. Uh, he came down the step, walked into the parking lot, looked, turned around, went right back out. And we was like, as kids, we knew like, I would say gay, you know, because back then I was cussing too, but I, I would have said the D word, you know? And I was like, wow, he, he didn't even acknowledge us. You know, we just get books that he, they used to send down here. And people my age could tell you that they went here in other schools. The books was like Jack and Jill, fun with uh, Dick and Jane like that. But either the front cover was ripped off or the word monkey was written in there or nigga. I mean, but we that's what we had to work with, you know? And that's why those teachers back then, I, uh, I truly honor them because they set the pace for a lot of us because my father was born here, but he couldn't go past sixth grade, you know? His father couldn't go to school at all. And, you know, his grandfather definitely better not been reading or writing back in them days, you know? so. Those are the type of things that always was in me, burning, you know, why people are treated this way. But you know, it's cool. You know, we, we surviving it, but this place here was, uh, it's like sacred gr ground to me, I guess you could, cause I get choked up talking about it because the lessons I learned here, and once we went over to Parker Gray, uh, it was hard for them to transition into us. Because if I was a minute late, because I couldn't get my locker open. If I did that three times in one week, I got suspended for a week, you know? And going through all that, I was going through uh, the race riots that happened when the guy Gibson got killed at the 7-Eleven. I was young, you know, and yeah. trying to put that together.
Well, first of all, you know, uh, the race relations uh, in this city hadn't improved that much. You know what I mean? The black stayed on that side, the white stayed on that side. And then we're talking about later on in the 70s when we started really mingling it up. But uh, you no, know, back then, from my perspective, the, the problem was that most of the whites just couldn't accept us, you know? We was told to love everybody regardless, you know? And my mother used to say, it's, it's good people that's white, it's good people that's black. And she used to point out the different colors. So that's what I grew up in. You know, like now, a lot of these kids not coming up like that, but that's why I thank my mom them so much. But yeah, but once we got over there and dealing with their system, it, it was like, uh, why are we here? So a lot of guys that did well in elementary school, they started turning to dropping out because by the time we got to the eighth or ninth grade, I think I had lost like six buddies that I used to hang with, you know, from elementary to middle school. Got disinterested in school. Back to your original question, uh, Mr. Gibson, he got killed in the 7-Eleven and the guy planted a knife on him. So that sparked off some racial tension, but the tension was already here because blacks were still being treated subhuman, you know, seriously. And I know a lot of people don't want to hear the truth, but that, that's what it is, it's the truth. And got to the point where they, you know what? Some of them had came through Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, so they was ready to go anyway. Me being younger than them, I'm watching them like, whoa, okay, well, this is what it's all about, you know? Uh, and they're hollering power to the people. I wanted to find out what that was about. But that w was sparked at uh, the burning and the rock throwing and all that, you know? And that's, I think that might've been the first time that the whites in Alexandria were like, hold up, you know? We gotta start paying attention to them over here because ain't nobody gonna wanna come here and make this an all-American city, and I'm just trying to make sure I help them keep it as an all-American city just by standing up to the promise that you made, you know? Uh, just like the Constitution or what have you, right? Bill of Rights, hey, you know, that's what it's all about, and I truly believe in that, you know? Well, when Robinson Library was a library, uh, we wasn't going to the library, you know? Uh, and then when I was about 12, it became what we call a counseling center, you know, outreach to the youth in this area. And then I think the first time we set foot in uh, any library, I know me going out on Queen Street, I might've been in the fifth grade, you know, really. It just was a place we didn't even go, you know, and uh, we didn't understand the importance of that. One of the gentlemen, uh, Williams, he has some relatives still here. I mean, that lives here because they grew up here. Uh, Bubby. His grandfather married one of my, grand, my great grandfather's sisters. So that's how we became cousins with the Evans. Not knowing that when we went in there, when I was 10 years old, not knowing that it had even occurred because nobody said anything about it. You might hear a little bit of, and that's why I think some of our parents kept us from there uh, because they said, well, don't go around at Queens Street Library. And when we tell them we went out to the library, don't go around there, you'll get in some trouble. That's all they used to say because they came through that. Cause my father was born in uh, 1922, in, you know, here in Alexandria. So I know he's seen all that, you know? And they used to tell us little things like that. But that library, uh, we may have made it off limits to ourselves mentally because of the, you know, things we heard, but there was nobody really trying to invite us in either, you know? So <laughs> it is what it is, you know? Let me give you the classroom. Yeah. Charles Houston, let's start there. Because I never went to kindergarten, so we're going to get that one out of the way, right? <laughs> Couldn't afford that. Charles Houston had desks that had probably been there since it was first built. 
Some of the chalkboards was crap. Even though the teachers used to have to take the chalk to write on the board. I'm left-handed. Every desk was right-handed. <laughs> you know, so I had to learn to write upside down. You know, uh, the rooms were like old cabins, seriously. I kid you not. It was on this site. Right. Charles Houston, right here. Yeah. I, Fifth grade? Uh, no, when I went here, I went to six. Went to and then you went over to transition over to Parker Gray Middle School from there. But uh, we didn't have the best equipment, you know, but they taught us how to spell our name. They taught us how to, if you had a phone, to dial your number and count, learn how to count the basics. And a lot of them always said something about keep reading, keep reading. They would throw stuff at you to read, you know. Uh, but they didn't have a lot to work with. They didn't. And I think we got everything that was either broke or they was ready to throw out in the, in, in the dump, junkyard somewhere, you know, uh, very seldom. The only thing I was seeing that was new when I was going to school here, and that was in the sixth grade, because they used to show us, they used to separate the girls, you know, when they take y'all and they show y'all one film about puberty, and they show the men the other film. That's the only time I saw a new projector, <laughs> you know? Because everything else was either chalkboard or those big old numbers on the flip chart, you know, or animals, uh, designs on flip charts. Okay, I'll start from uh, how I got there. My mom, I used to drive, we, we, well, me and my brother, and we would take her to the doctor or something like that. So I used to come past there, you know, uh, right before she retired. And she would always say, it's an old cemetery over there. And uh, it's been abandoned or something. She said, Michael, your grandfather name is over there. Something like, yeah, okay. And I was about 34 when she told me that, right? My mother died going on four years ago on Mother's Day. And six months after her death, no, maybe it was like four months after, I went to that cemetery. And I was looking and looking how messed up it was. And then I took another month, or maybe a month and a half, to find my great-grandfather, Warner Johnson, who my dad was named after, and then find records that say that my grandfather, Albert Johnson, who died September uh, the 3rd, 1956. I was born November the 13th, 1956. So I never got to meet him. And when I saw that, it was like, whoa, wait a minute. And then I looked and I'm like, hold up. It's a whole lot of more headstones. So I start walking around, mapping out in my head names for some reason. And no, oh, this is a true story. And I know it sounds a little far fetched, but that's how it went to me. And it's like, what do they call them, epiphanies? That's what it was. And it was like, why, why am I doing this? But I got to walking around. So then I start looking at the dates on the gray headstone. Then I'm looking at the condition. And then I went down and it had flooded. And they just set me off and I came back and it, the water was still there. And then when it rained again, it flooded. And I said, something wrong here. And then there was this white gentleman. And I hope he don't mind me mentioning his name, uh, James Blackman. He said, I saw you out here two years ago. You still coming out here. And I told him the story and he said, wow. Any help I can be, let me know. So I said, oh, wow, that's cool. He said, cause this, he said, this ain't right, you know? So that project right now is still, we're having dialogue. So looking at that, what was going on at Douglas and looking at what wasn't taking place, I said, hey, you know what? I gotta bring uh, the group I helped start, the SRG, Social Responsibility Group, and get some help. And like I told them, it's like a kid drowning. I don't care what hand reaches out to save you. When you drown and you grab the hand, whether it's pink, green, white, black, blue, you grab that hand. That's life. That's what I reach for. 
and everybody, like I said, they just came together. We want to work with uh, Alexandria uh, Historical uh, Association in the city to even help them raise money. The Social Responsibility Group, we put that together because we saw an uh, uptick in young people getting involved in the uh, legal system, you know, guns and fights and so forth. So we started that group say, well, how can we be, uh, instead of finger pointers, how can we be an asset to help other city agencies and nonprofits? So we came up with that, that, that name. Uh, and then I work also with a firefighters and friends to the rescue. So we do, we do uh, coats, backpacks, turkeys, toys, you know, uh, along with a guy, Keith Burns, who's from here, two-time Super Bowl champion with the Denver Broncos. Uh, then we work closely with the Sheriff Department, you know, uh, with their program, the Alexander Police Department, you know, uh, with some of their youth outreach program. Uh, so some years ago, about nine years ago, I would say now, these agencies really wasn't working together. Uh, I'm a boast and say I kind of like brought them together because people are there, you know, because people are territorial around here, and that's the other half of our problems, you know. And then um, I was doing something in the school, Pathways to Manhood, uh, working with some of those young men that was on the border, but you could pull back, uh, did that. Uh, so just about anything in this community they want to volunteer for, I try to help out, you know. I try to help everybody, you know, regardless.